1997. It's time to do more than just be vegan. Four of my so-called close friends, one who's still solid, decided we were gonna go liberate some animals who were enslaved in cages, soon to be murdered. So with Hilma, actually was the organizer. Everybody thought it was me, because I was the loudest, but I was still a novice. I was only two years vegan. Actually, one year vegan, two years vegetarian. And uh, we, she knew where this place was in Blanham, Ontario. Because she had been there before. This is all public information now, so I'm not saying anything that nobody doesn't know about. And uh, our first attempt actually was we had some in Michigan that we were going to go find, and we just uh, we were never able to locate those. So, anyways, the only thing that I added to the whole the planning was that we all had to go drive and meet each other somewhere so nobody could say that somebody twisted somebody else's arm and made them do it. And after we had actually four people ready to go, we needed a fifth, and my uncle, my mom's brother, was the only family member back then who would actually listen to me and watch videos. He'd never turn veg, but he and his wife and two kids, Caroline and Mike, would all sit down and watch the slaughterhouse videos, the fur videos, and they'd all cry. And they just listened. It's nice to have somebody listen back then. And he always told me, uh, Garrett, I don't want to do any vandalism. He knew about shit I used to do. He goes, but if you ever want to help an animal directly, I'd be interested. So he was the last addition. We realized we needed another person, one person to drive, a oh. couple people to open cages, a couple people to cut holes in the perimeter fence, spray paint ALF stuff. <laughs> so we went to the meeting point. We picked Easter Sunday for a reason. What was that reason? Religious society we live oh. in. We picked a gay uh, oh. religious and respect. And said, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna do something about the real teachings of Jesus on this day too, his resurrection. We're gonna liberate some animals that he would have definitely wanted to be free. So we go to our meeting point and sure enough my uncle is ends up being an hour late. And we were just about to leave and I said I knew he wasn't gonna do it, but whatever. Don't want anybody there who doesn't want to do it. And as we're about to pull away, he pulls up. So, on his own volition, he decided to join us. So we go, and we're looking at a couple farms up in Michigan, a couple hours away from Detroit. Can't find them. These places are located in rural America. Roll the back windows up. So we're driving around, it's two, three hours now. It's like, fuck, we can't find anything. And then Hilma brings up the place. She goes, I know where there is a place. I've been there before. And uh, probably about five sheds. We only got through a, well, a half a shed before the security came by. So we all agreed, let's go down there. So we cross the border, we go to uh, Plenum, and we decide that uh, Pat, the driver, is going to drop us off at the farm at 2 o'clock go back into town, we had spotted a bar, we are going to sit there for an hour, come back at three o'clock, one hour, whatever we can do in one hour, that's, that's the run that we want, just come back out front. I was going to open the cages, Robin was going to cut holes in the perimeter fence with Alan, and when she was done, she was going to come help me open the cages, Hilma was going to spray paint all over the farm. So everything's going pretty well, and we're into one cage. I'm opening door after door after door after door. I had this little rhythm going out, lock and lock, lock and lock, lock and lock. Now, I was warned before by a close friend of mine that we'll make a carnivore and they're going to attack me. And I remember telling her bullshit. Uh, they're going to know why we're all there. These animals have developed a sense that we never develop one that we lost along the way, the more we became disconnected from living in the natural world. I only had one incident. As I opened up cage after cage, one mink dove out and landed on my chest in an attack mode on her back hind legs. And I swear she looked at me like, I'm so glad you with the other guy jumped off. I'm like, yeah, I knew it, I knew it. So what was happening that night, 
wasn't 1,542 mink eventually trying to attack me. Those 1,542 mink looking for the exit. I remember their screams of joy, symphony of freedom. It's really surreal at this point, 13 years later, so I'm telling you the yeah. highlights that I was still going in my head. And they were just looking for the way out. And, uh, we got to the last shed. Robin joined me. And oh, by the way, I remember two cages that were just rusted so badly that I couldn't open them and I passed them. And then we had to get this going, so I was trying to cut and I, you know, pass them and then go like 10, 15 cages down and keep looking back like, like they were like, well, don't forget about me. And I'd go back and i just kick the fucking cage and break it. Because yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't just leave them there. I just could not leave them there. So twice that happened, I went back and destroyed a cage to get a couple of my guns. So Robin comes back and uh, she starts helping me and all of a sudden unfortunately I see some car lights going back and forth and I went over to Robin and grabbed her by the shoulder hang on, hang on a second and I said stay right here and I went and peeked out the shed. We were in the last shed. We were almost finished completely. Peek out and down the road, about a quarter mile, you see two cars talking to each other. You know, they would be facing a different way, so I knew something wasn't right. I paused for a second, and next thing I knew, I heard, Hey, motherfucker, stop right there! And it was the big farmers. And I grabbed Robin, and I grabbed her by the shoulder and the arm, and I'm like, Follow me! start running. We run out the shed. We had a pack before going in. Uh, whoever got away, got away. We were all willing to give our freedom. That's the way it was. Nobody obviously you know, squeals on somebody else. So I grab Robin. We start running. I can't pick her up and run with her. I, can, I thought she was behind me. It just took off. I dove over the fence. It's amazing what you can do with adrenaline rush. It's like a gymnast doing a, like a front roll. I dove and I rolled, didn't miss a beat, got up, ran into the field across the street. I look around, there's no problem. I'll tell you now what happened. She ended up freezing. She got scared and didn't run and she was apprehended on the spot by one of the big ones. I was terrified for her. She was a very close friend of mine and thought these scumbags were probably raping her, beating her up. We had a pact. The cops are there now. I see those two, three sirens going. So I run out into the field about 100, 200 feet. And I just kind of kneel down for a second. And all of a sudden I hear some rustling. Oh man. What is going on now? Somebody's walking towards me. And I just kind of whispered, like, Alan? Was my uncle. Alan, is that you? Is that Gary? And it was Alan. He ain't got no way. So we hooked up back there. But nobody else. No Hilma. Again, I know now Robin was apprehended, but at that point, no Robin, no Hilma. We found out later Hilma just laid down in the ditch when she was apprehended and found easily. They brought out police dogs right away. Now we hear the police dogs, by the way. So I look at Alan and get down like the soldiers and we're just going to crawl our asses as far as we can away back towards town. So we were like military. So we ended up crawling at least a mile, could have been two miles, like soldiers like this because they had the police dogs out, they had the lights out in the field, and they were out there, and we just kept going and going. We get back to town. Unfortunately, I had taken out my money and my ID, put it in the van because I thought, well, I don't want to have it on me, but if it falls out in the main liberation, Leave my ID there. Well, it turns out to be a bad move on my part, the money too. So we get back to town, and now there's only one convenience store open. And uh, I just know we gotta get out of there as far, uh, as far away as we can. We got no money though, we got no car, no getaway driver, Pat's nowhere to be found. 
somebody just got to call a taxi man and take a taxi back to Windsor. Uh, I was a VIP at the Windsor Casino back then. I'm like, just get, we'll get back to Windsor. I can get some money. We'll get across the border. So I, I go to the convenience store clerk and I ask him to call the cab for us. He calls the cab. And mind you, we are covered in mixed shit. Which is 3.30 in the morning, a couple guys, a couple Americans covered in big shit. <laughs> but, I had to do what we had to do. That's not what went badly. What happened was the cab driver shows up, and I said, I plead with him, and in treaty, I said, in the name of Jesus Christ and God, I beg you to drive us back to the Windsor Casino. I do not have any money on me right now. I took off a chain I had. I said, you can have this chain and this collateral but I will give you $500 once we get to the casino. This was a prank by some fraternity kids and they left us out here. We don't know where we're at. The guy felt some empathy for us. He looks at me and again, I pushed the, figured I was in rural religious America. I pushed the, please, the yeah. name of Jesus, will you do this, please? He said, okay, sure, get it. Thank you. So here Alan and I are in the car, not really talking. We didn't expect this to happen like this. We hope it went better, but we thought we were home free. All of a sudden, about a half hour later, the phone rings to the guy in the car, his cell phone. He starts talking, but the only thing he's saying is yes and no. It didn't make sense until after everything went down, but what had happened was the police had called and went around the city and went to the convenience store, asked if anything suspicious happened. The clerk says, yeah, some guys are looking really weird, asked me to call a cab. The cops were on the phone with, with the cab driver asking, are there two people in your car? Yes. Where are you taking? Are you taking them back to America? What are you, what are you, yeah. Do they smell like, like shit? Like animal <laughs> shit? Yes. Uh, are they acting weird? Yes. So anyways, what happened was the police were slowly finding out where the cab driver was. We were on the 401 to head back uh, from Blenheim to Windsor. So all of a sudden, we, Al and I do think we're home free. And then 45 minutes later, man, all of a sudden, these lights go on behind the top car and park behind the cabin. It's like, oh, man. The cops had their guns drawn, came out. We didn't resist. Again, we were willing to do this, willing to go to jail. The officers were actually really cool. Canada police are always really cool, all my experiences. And uh, we got arrested that night. Now, by the way, as the cops were stopping us, I leaned over to Alan and I said, don't say a word. Do you understand me? Remain silent. You say nothing. I can see he was freaked out though. And he wasn't really paying attention. So I said a couple of Alan. Do not say a word under any circumstances. Remember, they are not your friends. Exercise your right to remain silent. So they get us back to the police station. And of course the interrogation starts and all of a sudden they put us in a cell and across from us we can see there's Pat the driver, Hilma, and Robin. So everyone's kind of freaked out. One by one they take us in for questioning. Everybody else knew the routine about remaining silent. Well, everybody did but Alan, unfortunately, at that point. They took Alan in first, I believe. And after a half hour, 45, he comes out. I want you to say anything right. He goes, and I told him everything. What do you mean you told him everything? What do you mean? Well, they told, well, no, actually, it couldn't have been first because I, or we had gone at the same time because I, I knew the questions they were asking. Because I was in there laughing every time they asked me a question. I would just say, no. <laughs> I'm not saying anything to talk to my lawyer. My name's Gary Orofsky. My social security number is like military shit. But Gary, uh, you know what? You're going down. Everybody else is telling, everybody is telling us that you organized this. I'm like, my name is Gary Rowski. You can bring me an attorney anytime. On and on. And the police are adept 
and getting you to roll over. That is their job. They can lie legally to you, tell you all they're gonna, they're saying this. We're gonna take you. We're gonna take your dogs away. We told Alan we're gonna take your house away. You can lose your job. This is your only chance to speak. You'll never get another chance. You better say something now. And I'm just laughing and smiling the whole time. Like, okay, God, whatever. You can give me a lawyer whenever you want. And they finally back down with me. So. So we get put back in the cell, and I'm like, hell, everything's cool. And he says, no, he said, I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I've never been arrested. I've never been fucking arrested either. You haven't you watched enough TV shows and movies to know that you don't say anything? You take your right to remain silent and exercise it? Wait for your attorney? Yeah, but they said, I go, what'd they say? They're going to take your house? Yeah. Oh, guess what they said? The same shit. It's me. They said you're going to lose your job. You're never going to get a chance to talk to me. Yeah. Fucking idiot! <laughs> so it's a debacle, obviously, from here. <laughs> but the four of us, the others, remain silent. Now the court system is refusing to give us any bail. They claim that we're going to go back to America and never go back to Canada for the charges, and there's no extradition for bank liberations. So they're denying us bail, even though we have a right to it. This goes on for 10 days. Uh, day 10, a couple other horrible things happen. Number one, my closest animal rights friend at the time, Robin, ends up giving a statement because she freaks out because her parents threaten to disown her and her parents are wealthy and they're going to cut her off from the family money. During this, on this day 10, I, we were told that there was going to be no more delays. This is, no, there's never, I don't think there's ever been a 10 day bail hearing anywhere for anybody. Not a rapist and child molester, but hey, the mink liberation, the, the mink liberation has got 10 days for a bail hearing. My uh, attorney, they, they, they called a recess after they started court and they took us back to see our attorneys. We did have a different attorneys. And my attorney, Steve Brogan, sits down with me and says, Gary, uh, I just want you to know that Robin's in the back now uh, with the police and the Crown Attorney. And she's giving a statement and she's being bailed out and you guys are not. And now, this is like a mother being told that her son has just died in a car accident. Cop shows up, you freak out, you can't accept it. I remember raising my voice going, Steve, that is not what's going on. Do not say that about Robin. I don't know where the fuck you get your information from. She's not saying it. Gary is your attorney. I just want to let you know what's going on. I said, Steve, I don't want to hear another word about this. Whatever's going on back there is not what you think's going on. Robin's solid. She ain't saying shit. He realizes I'm very strong in my convictions about this and he's not going to convince me. So he backs off and we just start talking about the case. Game plans, things like that. Well, sure enough, about, whatever, an hour later, we all get brought back in the courtroom. And they had us all together in that little bench area. But now there's only four of us and there's no Robin. We're starting to get a little concerned. Still no Robin. And all of a sudden, Robin walks in the courtroom, teary-eyed. Tears rolling down her face with her head face down. She won't look up as she's walking up and they're leading her to the area where we're at and they open the little gate to let her in. And I am like looking on, I'm trying to get eye contact with her and she won't look at me. And I'm like, I mean, I'm like. And she sits down next to me and I can tell that she saved her own hands. And all of a sudden the judge comes in. Magistrate, I believe her name was Elaine Babcock, and she starts reading Robin's statement aloud. This is what we did. We met here, we met over here. It was Gary's job to open up the cage. It was Hilma's job to spray paint slogans on the sheds. It was Alan's job to cut holes in the fence. Pat was the getaway driver, and she was supposed to meet us in detail. They are reading her statement, and we're all four, even Alan, who had already given his statement, like looking at her like, then, in fact, one part of the statement was, and Hilma had been to the farm before and liberated about 50 animals, but stopped because security came. We're just like, 
Well, shit, why'd you just break up by everything when we were thinking like, hey, tell them about the windows we broke in McDonald's fucking three months ago. What the fuck, are you, what are you telling them that for? And then Elaine Babcock finishes the statement and says, Robin, why not? $10,000 bail. And they come and get her and she walks out and the four of us are sitting there. Now, fortunately, I had a good attorney and Alan had a good attorney because both of them stood up and said, Your Honor, you can't give one person bail and not the other people bail when they're charged with the same crime just because one person decided to cooperate with the state and the others decided to exercise their right to remain silent. And of course, the Crown Attorney objects, No! They did not go out, but she deserves it. She held us. But the point is, just because she helped you, they all have the same crime, the same charges. How can you deny one person bail and give one another? And the judge did listen and ended up going $10,000 bail for everybody. Now, by the way, this is outrageous. And something else happened to it. I need to point out. My attorney, Steve Rogan, also found out and brought up during this discussion argument that was going on about bail. Okay. You had just given a man from Michigan a thousand dollars bail three weeks earlier for second degree criminal sexual conduct. Now you know when a judge gets pissed off, they don't want to hear something, she goes flush red and screams, Steve, this has nothing to do with this case, I don't want to hear about that. Let's focus on the case at hand. And Steve said, Your Honor, it's got everything to do with this case. That guy was from Michigan and he gave him bail. He sexually assaulted a woman. My client wants to go to jail at this point. He wants to make a statement on behalf of the court. They're political prisoners. So that also helped to, get, to convince her that we had to get bailed out. So, that's the story of that. Now, the trial doesn't happen until two years later. Personally, I went through a three-day trial. Robin ended up not doing one day in jail. She never came back for the trial. Alan, because of his statement, ended up cooperating and forfeiting his $10,000 bail to the mink scum. And he never did a, jay, a day in jail, but during my trial, the, the key thing that, that convicted me was he took the stand. And when they asked him who I was and what I did, he pointed me out and told them everything. They really wanted to get me because of the vociferousness of the uh, and my, my mom, who doesn't understand animal rights at all, who didn't understand why I did that, actually told Alan, her brother, before the court hearing that day of the trial, if you get up on the stand and point the finger at my son, your nephew, I will disown you. And my sister said the same thing. He still ended up doing it. So they haven't actually, they, they, they stayed true. They haven't talked to him since. They haven't seen him since. So my, my uncle, you know, sold me out, sold me off the river. My closest animal rights friend did the same thing. Hilma Ruby was the only one that stayed true. Uh, to this day, she's the only true actress. Pat was willing to testify. It came out later. If they needed her, she was going to do anything to save her ass too. So only two out of five, me and Hilma, stayed true to the animals. And it wasn't so much that I was angry at Robin, Pat, and Alan, I was angry that they sold the animals out. We all had an agreement. This was for something bigger than our freedom, our safety. This was for somebody else. Part of the agreement, too, to get bailed out was we weren't supposed to speak to each other. Robin and I had talked after we got bailed out. It was like 10 days before I finally said, fuck that. I have to I have to find out how she can do this. I call her up one day. She knows it's me. And she picks up the phone and just starts crying. I haven't even said a word yet. About 30 seconds of her crying and nothing and puffing. All I said was, how could you do this? How could you do this? But Gary, there were... But Gary, nothing. How could you do this? Forget about me. You had been, she was vegan, I think, 11 years at that point. She had actually, she was a veteran. She had convinced Michigan State University to offer dissection alternatives. I was a novice. And 
It's all about the fam disowning, being disowned by her family and not having a trust fund. So, that was kind of a horrible scene. And, uh, it's just hard to trust people. This is why, I mean, this is when the betrayal began with Alan and Rob and why over the years I just really have a hard time trusting anybody to do anything started. So anyways, three-day trial goes on. Two years later, you know, the court system is slow. Just in Canada, like America. So we finally get to trial two years later. And of course, I'm convicted. And I had a speech prepared, which you can read online on my website. And I gave this speech, and my attorney was so opposed to me giving this speech because of the tone. No apology course, for me, explaining the injustices that animals endure. In a nutshell, I kind of said something that you're going to increase my empathy for the animals by putting me in a cage. I already have empathy. The 10 day bail hearing gave me empathy living in a cage. You will, you will not discourage me. It's not a deterrent. You make me angrier by letting me live the life of a cage animal. 25 big farmers were in the courtroom. The head of the big liberation in Canada was there. And I gave that speech. And my attorney, did. in fact, at the last minute, he's like, can I please still talk you out of this? I'm like, Steve, I kind of pushed him aside. I don't want to make a statement, then I'll tell the judge. So, the judge, you can see at several points during my speech, actually listening, Judge A. Cusinato, and understanding the logic that I'm preaching see him in another part of the speech that I can remember was if it's not a crime to torture, enslave, and murder animals, how can it be a crime to torture, to free tortured, enslaved, and soon to be murdered animals? We have a paradox here today and the court has to address this. That was a part that got him to go, mm -hmm. Here's a pretty good point. So here's the speech now. My attorney, Steve Rogan, had found out from the Crown Attorney that morning after he kind of knew I was going to get convicted that uh, I was going to get anywhere from two to three years. He didn't tell me, he didn't want to freak me out that day. Just So anyways, um, the judge ends up saying something to the effect, the, the, the trite platitude about it. It's not that I disagree with you, Mr. Urofsky, what you believe in, it's the way you went about it. And I interrupted him and said, don't tell me that everybody has broken unjust laws throughout history. Explain Gandhi, Dr. King, Thoreau, and Jesus, the whole thing, Rosa Parks, Nelson Mandela. Don't tell me laws haven't been broken to make everybody see the injustice. Now again, Steve's grabbed my arm like, do not interrupt the judge. But the judge backs down. And Steve, I get to look at Steve, he's like, I can't believe you interrupted the judge and he listened. And, and, you know, later on when I talk about Steve, I'm, I'm logical. If people would just shut up and listen, okay? I'm a genius. This is logical, simple stuff. Something else happened too where I interrupted him. I can't remember, but he backed off of that too. And uh, he ends up saying, I can see I'm not going to convince you to change your mind about the things you've done, but the laws of the land force me to send you to jail. And he takes his gavel and says six months in prison. Oh, just so you know, I had hoped that this judge was going to be the first judge in history to take his gavel and say, I cannot convict you for the compassionate things that you've done. This is why I went to trial, I wasn't trying to avoid my responsibility. I went and did the big liberation, the authorities offended me. I was there, I wasn't trying to get out of it. I wanted the judge to say, not guilty have done something noble and magnanimous and I cannot send you to jail. Fortunately, it did not happen. I believe it will happen one day. Some judge somewhere on this planet is going to strike his gavel down for an animal activist, a liberator, and say, you can walk out of this courtroom right now. I was like, just didn't deserve it. And you're not the criminal here. People harming the animals are criminals. Now, again, now Steve pulls me aside too and says, man, I... That speech work, that just so you know, you were getting two to three years. You just saved yourself about two, two and a half years with this sentence. 
as they, uh, you know, and they always wanted a set of sensing day later on. They're like, let's send a sensing day for three weeks from today. And they lean over to say, I'm like, uh-uh, I don't want to I'm not sitting in jail for three weeks of wondering what I'm getting. I want my sentence right now. So he asked the chronic, how he asked the judge, he says, my client would like to be sent. Do you mind doing this right now? Let's get this over with. The judge says, sure, let me take a 10 minute break and go back in my chambers, blah, 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 figure this out. So anyways, that's why I got the six month sentence now. Um, they cuff me. And I'm in, I mean, I'm in militant mode. Most militant probably ever. Did not affect me. It didn't hit me, you know, until I hit the prison cell by myself at all. Yeah. Shit, what the fuck? <laughs> I'm still, I'm fighting for the animals. They cuff me and they walk me down the aisle to get out in 25 mink farmers and I just stop and look down the aisle, head up and proud, looking straight in. And the officer pulled me, kept me walking. And uh, that's that part of the story. <laughs> he put me in a cell. I'm, I'm expecting about uh, a big fight too about the veganism. I didn't realize how wonderful Canada was with accommodating people's requests. <laughs> they put me. They bring me to the infirmary. And our nurses are questioning me. Anything we should know about you? Any problem? I'm like no, I'm not, you know, no physical problems, nothing like that. But I am vegan, and I'm just ready for a fight. And they just write it down on their chart. I'm like this isn't a problem. Well, as long as you tell us before you get in here. And I'm confused because <laughs> I hear all stories across America, people can't get vegan food. And I kind of look around the room and there's a, there's a chart on the wall that says World Diets. Kosher. Halal. Vegetarian. Vegan. And it had a definition for each one. I'm like, holy really shit. So, um... They were great, greatly uh, accommodating of my veganism. In fact, it, it gave me seven, eight vegan meals in rotation. From vegan hot dogs, vegan chili, to stir-fried tofu, PB&J. Uh, something else that's... Huh? Oh, and by the way, part of the speech was explaining that I was going to do a 40-day fast on behalf of the animals freaked out the whole entire system and unfortunately the fast only ended up lasting 10 days and quickly here's why I preached a lot in jail and the other prisoners were really listening and in order to garner this one I thought media was important back in the day the other prisoners are uh, people uh, oh, we had thought that if other people got involved in this hunger strike because I had people actually on the outside in different states doing symbolic one to seven day hunger strikes too in their cities to get more media attention for the animals on the fur farm to make weapon that's broken in. I actually convinced around a dozen prisoners to do one to seven day hunger strikes in accordance with mine. Now, as nice as the Canadian officials are, the one thing prisons do not like is disorder. There are rules to be followed. Again, most of the officers there, the correction officers, were actually thought it was outrageous I was there. They came up to me, asked for information, told me they read my jacket, thought it was outrageous. They put me in the EMDC, this maximum security detention center. Now the prison finds out that other prisoners are joining this hunger strike. So on day 10, they take me down and day nine, day before, whatever, they take me down to the hole, and the hole is just as bad as it is in movies, that's not an exaggeration, it's a concrete room, no mattress, no pillow, and a toilet, that's it, what a thing. I never, I don't take other people down with me, hence me not cooperating with the state, and squealing on no more Robin or Alan. I realize these prisoners are doing it for me. We got along. They understood a little of the issues, but they weren't animal rights actors. They didn't understand the grand scheme of things. They understood it was wrong. We'd be breaking the next thing. They were getting the fur issue while I was there, but everything else it was just so they the 
warden comes down and they say, just so you know, we are now actively searching for everyone else who is doing a hunger strike. And when we find out, they are all getting extra charges added to them for disrupting disorderly conduct. They're going to get anywhere from 30 to 90 days added to their sentences. And that's now also not too cool uh, in jail to be <laughs> getting other people in trouble. So I ended up backing down off the hunger strike and I said, if I agree to start eating, you promise me that you won't search for anybody else and leave them alone. And the warden said, okay, we can agree to that. And he tells one of the other officers, go down to the kitchen, tell him to bring this man some stir-fried tofu, one of his dishes. And you are going to eat in front of us, though. They bring now this and by the way, this, I mean, this tore me up. I was in tears. I I had a moment during this whole discussion to resolve the hunger strike. I had called Jerry Velasic, my dear friend, and Chris Velucci, a couple other cool cats that I was really tight with, and I was crying and weeping, and I thought I was letting everybody down. And they told me Gary, Paul Watson was really hot back then. He wasn't on a TV show and doing commercial shit. He was. He was still sinking whaling ships and causing hell all around the, the world. And Jerry O'Cress said to me, do you think if Paul Watson was doing a 40-day hunger strike and after day 10 he stopped, people would think less than him? Would you think less than him? I said, no. People feel the same way about you, man. Do what you gotta do. So they bring the stir-fried tofu down and in front of them I had to eat it, and I did. And they were honorable search for anybody after that. And, uh, ended up preaching a lot in jail too. Quick funny story about the preaching, especially on day one when I was in, after the infirmary incident, they bring me down to one of the holding units before they move me to my you know, final resting place. I was all, there was a, a TV set out in the corner and the about 18 to 20 guys in there Alpha male's got the clicker and he's putting on the 5, 5, 36, 6, 30 news. Lead story in Canada that night. International terrorist Gary Yarofsky sends to jail tonight. Gary Yarofsky, international terrorist. Every station had international terrorist next to my name. And why international? I'm from Michigan. It's Canada. I'm global. <laughs> so I'm getting a kick out of it. And the guys realize finally I'm in the cell with them because one guy's kind of looking at the TV, looking around the room, and he sees me back in the corner, he's like, that's the guy back there, that's the guy back there. And he goes around, and the alpha male walks up to me, and he says, uh, you an international terrorist? I said, uh, yeah. He said, that's funny, man, you don't look like an international terrorist. I said, well, maybe that's because of the exact opposite one. Here's why I'm here, freed some mink, they had their necks broken, we ripped their skin off. Now, first thing he said to me and everyone in jail was, what the hell's a mink? And I had to explain it. Mink's like a big ferret in the grown family. And then the next thing they said to me, and this is kind of a paraphrase, but the intonation is, is, is identical, Ver verbatim. They say, wait a second, they put you in here with us? Now, some of them, this was a maximum security detention center. So you were either there because you got a two year or less sentence or you were going through a trial awaiting your sentencing and you were a child molester, a rapist, a murderer. You were a, a multiple convicted felon. These were bad people, hence the, with us? They knew they were bad people. They didn't get in. They're like, they put you in here with us because you freed some rats? I said, well, they put me in here with you because I also caused $2.1 million in damage to the mink farm and put them on a business permanently to this day, and we do not tolerate economic sabotage in our society. I was told too by my attorney that uh, in Canada you only do two-thirds of your time, and at one-third you get a chance for parole. Not that I would have agreed to a parole, I've never done that in America either. Um, so I'm, but he, all, he said when they do the parole hearing, they're probably just gonna deport you. Why do why does the Canadian system want to use their tax dollars for an American that's convicted? So sure enough, I go in and they agree that uh, they're going to deport me and throw me out of Canada. And it was, uh, it was a nice moment. Again, listen, prison is very liberating. 
believe it or not. It's confining too, it's not a wonderful place to be. But as Dr. King once said, if you go into jail, turn that place, you know, from a prison into a haven of freedom. And it's very, it's very empowering to lose the fear of the system. So, um, I knew I was getting out of it. They didn't tell me the exact day. They just said, we're going to deport you soon, blah, blah, blah. It ends up happening 17 days later. This is on uh, day 60. They tell me I'm getting out, so 77 days. And it's so weird how you go from being in a cage to being free. And a lot of things we take for granted, too, like color. I mean, the only things I saw in jail, color-wise, were, were orange jumpsuits and blue, and blue prison guard uniforms. Everything else is gray. And, and we weren't in a penitentiary setting where you can go outside all day. We were in a, a detention center. You, you got out of your cell for, you know, three times a day to eat and maybe for a half hour to an hour to watch TV and, you know, play checkers. So we were in lockdown most of the time. They took us outside into a little courtyard inside the facility for 20 minutes if they wanted to, if they felt like it. So, because when I got out, all the colors, the green, uh, when I got back to my apartment, the browns and all these reds, like overwhelmed me, I almost passed out. But I remember that uh, I found out the day before from my attorney that tomorrow, the poor you, you're getting out. And uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't sleep the night before, obviously. Didn't want to get out. And I wake up and I'm asking the guards, as cool as they were, there is a, always a mind fuck going on about not telling you exactly what's going on. I'm like, am I getting out right now? Are they going to take me right now? We don't know, Gary. We don't know. So breakfast comes and I'm out and looking and looking and waiting for the jingling keys. When you hear jingling keys, it's always a good sign somebody's getting their cage open. And nothing, sure enough. Now we were in there for a couple more hours. Now lunchtime comes around, it's 11 o'clock. We go out, am I getting out? Am I getting out? We don't know, Gary. Nobody told us anything. Lunch goes by, put me back in the cell. And I'm now with my cellmate, and we're talking. I'm like, when did they get me? He's like, dude, you're lucky to be getting out. Would you just relax? Okay, well, I wish they were coming to get me today. Who cares if it was 11.59, you know, today. So all of a sudden, I hear some keys, Jake. I jump up. They open up the cage and say, Yurovsky, get your stuff. You're a free man. Let's go. And within five minutes, I was up front. Gave me my clothes and uh, there's two finches over here. By the way, I need to stop the store. Oh, yellow they're finches. Yellow. I can't see. I can't see because my hair is stuck. You have to look in the middle. You have to get up. I can't. I can't get up. Okay. Well, you within five minutes. That was. Oh. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. The other end of the story. Within, end the story. In five <laughs> minutes, I'm up front. They gave me my street clothes, put them on. Two people uh, with the Canadian Customs were there, put me in a van, handcuffed me, and started driving me back to the border. And uh, let me actually say one more quick thing. In the car, a little mind fuck happened too. I'm asking them, you know, what are you just going to do? Pass me over to America, and then I just walk out and free. And they said, well, they might hold you there. I don't know what they're going to do. You might not be getting out there. We've heard of people being held there for weeks and weeks. I'm like, my heart dropped. I and mean, I went from freedom, no freedom, to freedom, to all not out yet. And it's like, you're kidding me. So they take me into the you know, customs area when we finally get there. And they sign me over like I'm an object to the American people. And they walk me into this office. And I guess the head of the customs of the American side says, so what's your story? I said, I'm got to freed all that mink. I know you heard about it in the papers. He goes, that was you? I said, yeah. Let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> and just like that, I walked out the door. My dad was sitting there uh, waiting for me, cigar in his mouth. Nice face to see when I got out. And that was that. I just recently read this story about this Nazi. His name was Ernst Gerber. He and his men were executing children one day, but he didn't like the way his guards were grabbing kids by their hair. Before they shot him in the back of the head, he tossed him in a mass grave. 
He actually ordered his men to stop 